the Bell Road, Road testimony. testimony. You know, we have a testimony to our neighborhood, right? We should be should, should, paying should, attention, paying attention, attention. To our life is it in right standing with God the victory has been won it's won we should be paying attention to the Bell Road testimony let's sing it again again and again and again the Bell Road testimony you know we have a testimony to our neighborhood right if we leave our Christmas decorations up into February that testimony might mean we love Christmas so much that we want it all year round and unfortunately, I couldn't leave my Christmas decorations up because our homeowners association, that prestigious neighborhood, the Greens, it says that you can't leave your decorations up past January 2nd. So I had to take them down. But we've kept our Christmas trees up here because of the Christmas gift to Bell Road Baptist Church. And if I had my way, we would just keep the trees up all the way until the mortgage is paid off. It's not due to be paid off till. January 2014 but you know we could pay it off in this year 2012 and it would free up some resources so maybe our treasurer wouldn't have to wring her hands ever are we going to be able to pay the bills well I will support the testimony of my church a singular testimony I don't think that we're being lazy or neglectful for having our Christmas decorations up it allows the pastor to talk about paying off the house early and we'll do that by supporting the testimony of our church by faithful attention you like the way I put that by paying attention Next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we start a membership course. Right now I have two people enrolled. At least one is enrolled, and he said he would talk to his wife about getting up a little earlier so that they could get down to the church house by 9 o'clock. Maybe you've been a member here longer than me, and you never took a membership course, or you can't recite the church covenant by heart yet. We're going to consider the church covenant next Sunday morning during the Sunday school hour. Then the following Sunday, we'll go through the church constitution, how we're supposed to make decisions around here. I want to pay faithful attention to my testimony by living a godly life. You wouldn't want an old perverted preacher who spent the night looking at pornography on the internet and then get up here and preach because of the office. Would you? Mm -mm. You'd want that man the best he can to be living a life that is in right standing with God, keeping accounts short. No long-term hidden sins because of human pride. Someone said, I won't confess my sins to another man. I only confess my sins to God. You know what? That's a cop-out. God lets you off easier than your fellow man. And you can make God into your own image. God who says, well, that's okay, that's all right. Who won't hold you accountable to your tears, to your prayers at the altar, to your, your sincere asking as the young man read from God's word today, Lord, will you search my heart? We look deep into my heart. That's what we do every Sunday when we come here. We should be paying attention to our life. Is it in right standing with God? Not just on the first Sunday of the month before we take the Lord's Supper, but maybe Saturday afternoon getting ready for Sunday morning so that like the preacher, you can stand up and say, I'm here as a fellow sojourner along with you. And I have victory in Jesus. I had to, I had to look up the, the hymn. It talked about the victory being won, but it was spelled O-N-E, you know, in that second hymn. I thought, huh, well, I can make that. I can, I can understand that my victory is won, like one with Christ and one with God the Father. But I, I looked it up, and it's actually spelled W-O-N. Like I kind of thought, you know, the more basic understanding. The victory has been one. It's one. I stand here today as a victorious Christian by keeping my account short with the Lord. Let's sing it again.
Let's sing it again. Again and again and again. Well, we are biblical, aren't we? The Apostle Paul said, I'll say it again. Can you shut up in there? It's past midnight. You already sung that hymn. What's Paul and Silas do? They sing again and again. These songs of deliverance. I'll pay attention to the words of the song. Am I just repeating a, a vain prayer? A, a prayer that somebody else wrote. And it was sincere and it was heartfelt, but when it's presented to me on a Sunday morning, I'm just going through the motions because I like the melody or, hey, I got this one. Not paying attention to the spelling of the word, to the way that word interacts with the other words in the sentences before and after, how that song interacts with the, the song the choir sang. How if just a little, one or two people clap in their hands, is that pleasing to the Lord? Or is it just a vain repetition? No, that's what we do at the end. We clap our hands, whether we appreciate it, whether we understand it, whether we affirm it or not. I will pay attention. I will live a godly life because I want to support the singular testimony of my local church. And I will give regularly. Oh, it goes so far beyond money. But money is a good thing. You can do some things in this world if you will give regular faithful gifts. Your heart, your mind, your strength, your abilities, your wallet. I give God the best I have. I study his word and I try to present it as a teacher in this generation. So we've been going through three books of the Bible since Easter 2007. Three books. The Gospel of Luke, the Book of Acts, and Paul's letter to the Romans. And I think we'll finish it up this year as these books and these teachings, these personalities, these truths collide with one another as we pay attention to the word week by week. Maybe even pay attention to something the Lord said two years ago during a baby dedication. Or even just last week. Has anybody worked the message of last week? Do you remember these characters? Felix, he was a governor. Tertullus, an attorney. Let's not hiss at the attorneys because we have one among us today. All right, so let's not come down on the lawyers. Tertullus presented a case against Paul to the governor, Felix. And Felix said, I want to wait and think on this a little bit. Paul would stay in Caesarea for two years, and Felix would, from time to time, come to see Paul there in Herod's palace. And the Bible tells us, the writer of Acts says that, Felix had in his heart that he thought he might be able to get a bribe from Paul. So there's a wrong motive for Felix coming and talking to the Bible teacher. Just as sometimes there's a wrong motive for coming to church, but God can get a hold of us. I don't know what happened in Felix's life, but Felix was replaced by this guy, Festus. Festus wasn't as experienced as Felix. Festus became the governor after these two years that Paul stayed in Caesarea. And I have posited that he wrote the book of Philippians, the letter to the church at Philippi during those two years that he was imprisoned in Herod's palace. Oh, his friends could come and go and bring him what he needed. Shortly after Festus came on the scene, King Agrippa and his sister Bernice came to visit. We saw the scene from the visual Bible of Agrippa and Bernice at a party. Now, the Bible doesn't say that Festus threw a party. And so once in a while, Hollywood or even the Christian filmmakers go beyond what is written. So there's this party. And I think it was several months ago, we were last here, and I stopped not because of the belly dancer at the party. But yeah, I think we would have had to rate it PG-13. 
even though it was a Christian film. At least, I don't know how appropriate it is for Bell Road Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. Maybe at home on the DVD, the belly dancer scene just comes and goes. But it's not in the Bible. Bible doesn't talk. You can look it up. Acts, where's the belly dancer scene? It's not there. There's not even a party scene. But, um, you know, it probably it would, would be a normal thing for Festus, the new governor, to throw a little party for Agrippa and his sister Bernice. But I decided to kind of bring it down to a G by replacing the belly dancer with this guy, Rick Bez, who's among us today. I called him yesterday and told him I've done a little creative editing of the visual Bible to make it appropriate for Sunday morning at Bell Road. Let's watch this. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But... If the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them, that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has faced his accusers and has had an opportunity to defend himself against their charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I'd expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he'd be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death. 
but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. This is Paul's testimony, but this is the Bell Road testimony. This word of God has been passed down to us. The story that Paul told was true. We read about it in God's word. We have accepted this story as true, and we pass the story on to the people around us. It is our testimony. Yes, we do believe in the birth of Christ, his passion, his suffering, his betrayal, his intercession for us as he hung from the cross, his death and his resurrection. Christ lives today. This is our testimony. And Saul was chosen by God to be an ambassador to most of us, the Gentiles. So Paul shares his testimony. Just as the young lady sang today and shared her testimony, I am redeemed. I once was lost, but now I'm found. My life has turned around. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I am redeemed. You heard Paul say that he 
voted for the death of Christians. So this is his testimony. He speaks to the great Festus, the governor, King Agrippa II, Bernice. He speaks to them and testifies to them that once he was different than he is today. O King Agrippa, we all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? It's a blessing for me to consider that every born-again Christian in this room has had to ask, Who are you?